We're here today to talk about um, agreements with your physicians, um, either an employment agreement or an independent contractor agreement. And uh, this is going to be a critical aspect of uh, your urgent care practice for a variety of reasons, which we'll go through today. <clears throat> um, we've heard some, some uh, generally good news at the conference about how urgent care centers are doing, and um, it's, that's all great. I will say that you know, one of the urgent cares that I found out about that didn't work out was um, uh, one in California that um, we actually represented uh, a few years ago in an employment lawsuit. And um, one of the things that I think led to their downfall was a problem with the physician. Um, the physician was not really doing what needed to be done, and uh, there, were, there were significant problems that arose out of that relationship. Um, so thinking this through from the beginning, what kind of physicians you're bringing on board? Um, are they going to be a fit for your organization? Are they going to be the type of person that you want to um, move forward with and that, that are going to able going to enable you to succeed, it all starts from the beginning and it all starts with uh, who are we bringing on board and, and what kind of agreement are we going to have with them. So having a strong agreement at the beginning is really, really important. <clears throat> so uh, I have no financial relationships to disclose and I will not discuss off-label use and or investigational use in my presentation. These are the objectives that we have for today. We're going to want to talk about whether um, employee or independent contractor status is, is the best strategy. <clears throat> We're going to de define the provisions that we want to have in our agreements, um, classifying the provisions that are often in dispute and how to negotiate them, recognizing trade secret and unfair competition issues, and uh, looking at lessons from mistakes typically made and how to avoid them. So um, pre-hire due diligence. This is a really critical stage. And in the employment arena, we see this all the time, and it doesn't matter the industry. Uh, the unfortunate reality is that people tend to uh, kind of skip this step. And they get excited about the relationship, and everything's moving forward. And, uh, and they don't necessarily go through all the, the uh, thought process they need to in terms of bringing someone on. If later that person doesn't work out, you end up kicking yourself and saying, well, why didn't we do this or why didn't we do that? Um, in the traditional industries that we work with, it usually starts with an application. You're checking the references off the application. You're seeing if they'll talk to you. It's obviously, it's often very hard to get um, people to talk candidly about um, somebody, but you need to make your best effort. Uh, and that applies to physicians. You're going to, just, just as if they were any other employee in any other industry, while physicians tend to have um, obviously a much higher level of sophistication in terms of coming in, um, and their background is going to be different than um, that typical employee, you're still going to want to do a fair amount of due diligence in terms of trying to check their references and seeing what you can find out about them. Um, where they've worked before, well, are there people who are going to be willing to tell you about them? You really need to make those phone calls. Uh, it's, it's very important. Uh, and, and asking the physician up, up front, you know, would you be willing to share your references? Who can we call? And, and all of that. Um, the interview process is often something that, is, <clears throat> that does tend to be a little bit um, not as thought out as it could be, I think. I think employers could do a lot better job um, sitting down and, and not making it so much a just kind of a, a friendly back and forth, but really more thinking, what are the questions that I need to ask this person? Um, telling them about our practice and how are they going to fit into this urgent care center? Why do you want to practice urgent care medicine? Why do you want to practice in this location? Um, what, are the, what motivates you? What are the things you think you can bring to, to what we're doing? Um, were there any other career paths you, you thought about within um, medicine, other special, did you consider becoming a specialist or things of that nature? Trying to feel them out as to why they're there, what motivates them, uh, and what brought them to apply um, to your center. Uh, joint consultations, this is something there's been a lot of discussion about during the conference uh, this weekend that's been pretty interesting. Um, and the, the real importance for urgent care in the industry to have a physician who is going to be uh, good with patients and it's going to be able to create a bond with the people that are coming to see you. 
And, and that, <clears throat> given the amount of explosion of urgent care centers, uh, the growth in the industry, and in certainly in certain urban centers, uh, the New York, New Jersey area, or where I'm coming from, Southern California, Florida, uh, where you just are seeing a start, starting to see a saturation of urgent care centers. You're going to really need to differentiate yourself from your competition. And how are you going to do that? A lot of what you're offering is similar to what these other entities are offering. So you've got to figure out a way to set yourself apart. If your physician doesn't have a, a, a good presence with, um, with the people who are coming in, that can be an absolute disaster. So now you've brought this person in, and now you've got to separate yourself from them. It's, and I've seen it happen. Uh, so it's really hard to do that. You want to get this right at the beginning. And so one way to do that that I just put out as an idea, uh, sure. Sorry, back up for that direction. Yes. No, anybody who has questions, feel free to. Um, Yes, uh, this is an, uh, has been a problem as long as I've been practicing employment law. It, it will always be a problem. And it comes from the fear that the referring person is going to get sued for defamation, which I understand. And we are always counseling our clients. Just basically, the safest way to go is give the name, rank, serial number. Just, you know, they, their person worked here from this date to that date. This was the last position held. Unless they authorize us to give out more, we don't. That is, unfortunately, the safest thing to do. So you get that a lot. Now, in California, where I'm from, there's a section of the Civil Code that allows for uh, uh, referrals to be privileged if they're made without malice and they're made for legitimate purpose and all that. Other states may have that, but people don't really care about that in reality. They just don't want to give the information. So essentially, the way I look at it is, they should have referrals that are willing to talk about them. If they don't have people who are willing to talk about them, those, then they don't have referrals. So if they give you someone who just says the name rank serial number, you can assume that bad things happen. I mean, you just have to assume that bad things happen I mean, how, with that relationship. Because otherwise, they would be telling you. I mean, they have to, I, if they're right out of med school or they're right out of their training um, or their residency, then that's one thing. But if they've been practicing for a few years and they should have three or four referrals and they don't, then that's just, that's a, a huge red flag. So you've got to just deal with it that way. Yeah. I mean, in theory, that, that's why people don't give those, um, they don't give those referrals because you don't want to get, um, you don't want to have someone come back and point the finger at you that you led me into a negligent hiring situation. I got sued by a patient. You told me things that led me to believe this person was the expert at um, what they were doing or were perfectly competent, and they weren't. And you had reason to know. You know, like if you, the person knew that they had malpractice issues or, and said, no, I don't know anything about it, then they're obviously going to be facing some potential liability there if something goes wrong. So. You know, it's a difficult, that's why people typically say nothing. So, I mean, the rule of thumb basically is you need good references. If people are giving you cryptic responses or no responses, that's a, that's a negative reference in this, day, in this day and age. So, <clears throat> so one thought is you could have joint consultations. You could, you could bring them in and say, look, um, could we watch you kind of go through some, um, some initial consultations on kind of a trial basis of, or maybe you could set something up where you brought somebody in who pretended to have this or that and you watched them. Come up with some creative scenarios where you could get a sense of how they interact with people. Um, and also because urgent care is such a referral driven business, if somebody comes in and they, they like the doctor, they're going to go back and tell so many other people that's a great place, it's a great alternative, the doctor's really sympathetic and figures out things and really cares about your situation. That's huge. And the opposite is equally bad. Um, 
Okay, so timing. Um, I will tell just a brief story about uh, the importance of doing employment agreements properly, and that is a uh, client, this was not in the medical industry, but the same thing could happen here, who uh, offered employment, they were based in California, and they offered employment to someone in Florida by text message. And they went in this long, detailed text message exchange about the job and what it was going to be and all that. And that was it. That was the agreement. And then the person moved from Florida to California. And long story short, it didn't work out. The person had misrepresented that they had all this experience. It was a complete disaster. And they had to fire her. So there was no offer letter. There was no agreement. Her um, personnel file mysteriously disappeared because she was the HR manager. Uh, so there was nothing except these text messages, which the lawyer for this person then sent over and said, you know, we have a contract here, and you promised all these things. And actually, in the case that I was talking about when we opened, about that doctor in the urgent care center, that case, not only was the doctor a problem, there was, there was a lawsuit that was brought by um, the bookkeeper, and she was suing for age discrimination and all these other things. And they had offered her a job by email. And the doctor who owned the clinic uh, just sent her an email, which was fairly detailed about how much you're going to make, what your benefits are going to be, um, and all these things. And he said in there, three-year term. Okay, And fortunately, just that happened to save him, and I don't know if he even thought about that he was doing this, but he said, to be, can be terminated on 60 days notice. Okay, that was huge for him, because had he not put that in there, because they ended up having to terminate her, and it didn't say for cause or at will, it said nothing about how she was employed, it just said three-year term. So that's, the, that's why we do this. Uh, you just cannot, and we're moving, everybody's moving 100 miles an hour nowadays, we're on our phones all day long, we're on our emails, and there is a tendency to cut corners and send an email to some, you, I could see someone sending an email to some doctor saying, hey, here's how it's going to be. The doctor then comes on board, and everybody has the best intentions of having an agreement, and it never gets done, and, and we see this all the time. It never gets done, or it gets put in their file, and only one of the parties signs it, or it's not dated, all these things. So you got to think it through and have a protocol of, okay, how are we going to do this in the timing? Um, the offer letter is fine. An offer letter is good. Uh, it spells out the general terms, and it says things, it, you know, it's going to say the comp, it's going to say uh, the general benefits, it's going to set forth uh, maybe a few other things, and then maybe give them a date. You give them a hard date at, upon which to um, respond by, to accept or decline. And then, so that sets the, t that sets the stage. And then, if they accept it, then you can memorialize it in a long-form agreement. And that's where you set forth and spell out everything. But um, all this should be done before their start date. So the long-form agreement will say what its effective date is. Now, it could have a different start date. So you could say, um, you could do the agreement, everybody's on board and agree about it. Uh, and we would say, okay, it's going to be effective on October 11th, 2014, with your start date to be you know, November 1. You could do that. But you want it all ironed out before they walk in the door. Everybody should be signed off on that agreement. So negotiation priorities. Oh, yes? It's kind of a pain, but yeah, you have to. You would have to make it contingent, and you really would have to spell that out. You would definitely have to spell that out, because otherwise they might say, "Well, you didn't say that it was contingent, and you made it a, a one-year term, and you didn't say that I could be terminated. You didn't say how long it would take me to get credentialed. I mean, for all I know, you're just hiring me to do admin things for the next six months until I get credentialed. You didn't say that I have to be actually servicing patients. You know." So, you, yeah, you have to, and in the offer letter, you would say that. Now, part of the offer letter and the timing, the issue, like in California, we have Labor Code 970, which says you cannot um, make false statements that would induce someone to move from one place to another, change their residence, or within the state or from out of state to in the state. 
And that is a major uh, violation of labor code and significant penalties. But even if your state doesn't have something like that, it's going to have fraud and misrepresentation as a tort, which means that you can't make misrepresentations to induce someone to, to accept employment. So again, this is why it's so critical to spell it out at the beginning. Don't wait around, because then if, if something happens, they can say, well, I just moved from Minneapolis to Atlanta. You told me it was going to be these things. It's not. I'm suing you. And we do see those lawsuits. So that's why you need to uh, make it very clear. Um, and also, sometimes timing gets screwed up. So if you don't spell out the benefits and generally what the terms are going to be, which is why offer letters are good, and they give notice, um, and then they come down, and the comp is different, or the, um, the uh, hours are different, or whatever it is, and, and they've given notice, and they can't go back to their old job now. So they have no choice, really, but to file a lawsuit. So you don't want them giving notice. Ideally, you don't want them giving notice until everybody has agreed and signed off on the employment agreement. Then they give notice. Then you're good. <clears throat> Okay, so negotiation priorities. Point here is just you need to give thought in advance before you get into the negotiations what's most important to you. Obviously, compensation is going to be first and foremost on everyone's mind. Um, that may already have been something you've spelled. You already are going to have an idea about that. So, and they probably will too. But what's the next most important thing? And the next, and the next, and the next. It's helpful to sit down, make a list, is it the hours they're going to work, the shifts, the number of patients they need to see, uh, the types of benefits you can afford to offer them, whatever it may be? Because um, there's going to be some give and take. <clears throat> Most physicians are sophisticated enough that they go get their own attorney. And when you send the employment agreement, it's, I'd say it's less than, in my experience, less than, I don't know, 20%, maybe even 10% of the time they sign it and send it back. It's usually it coming back from their attorney redlined up with some changes. Um, now, that negotiation is usually pretty friendly because obviously they want the job, so it's not this hostile thing. But you need to think that through in advance, and you don't expect that it's just going to come back signed. Um, so they'll generally, there's going to be some back and forth. So what are the downfalls of not having the employment agreement? We've talked about some already here. And uh, we talked about the breach of contract. Certainly, when you, um, if you don't put things down in writing, you can have an oral contract that's created that's either express, like promising them something, uh, orally can, can create a contract, an enforceable contract, or an implied contract by what the parties would have reasonably intended. So that could occur as well. And we've talked about the fraud misrepresentation side of it. From a morale perspective, if you have someone, just setting aside the legal, if you have someone who comes in, and let's say legally you, you have set it up so that you can kind of force this on them, different from what they expected. Okay, great, but now you have someone who doesn't, is not happy on day one. And this just came up last week with one of our clients who, uh, one of the managers that they hired, they had made misrepresentations to some extent um, about what his title was going to be. So they made a mistake, basically, and they said it's going to be one thing, and then it was less senior. Now, that employee was at will, and it was clear that that employee um, had no uh, right to, uh, to any title or, or anything from a legal standpoint. But from a um, morale standpoint, it's not great to have the employee come in and on the first day say, hey, you're, this is going to be different. So you need to think about, um, about that as, also, as well as precedent. So, Whatever you're agreeing to, if you're going to have multiple doctors in your org organization or if you have multiple centers, um, if you agree to something with one doctor, it's going to be kind of hard to say to the next one and the next one if they're all roughly the same skill level, um, well, we're, you're not getting this benefit or we're paying you differently. And that also opens the door to, um, to potential discrimination claims. So whether it's sex or race or what have you, you don't want to be treating people inconsistently who are similarly situated, similarly skilled, et cetera. Nope. So uh, some doctors are fairly sophisticated, and uh, as I said, they have attorneys. So they may ask you before they come on board, hey, can I see how the center's doing? Uh, would you be willing to share the revenue with me? 
Uh, would you be willing to give me some of the policies and procedures that would apply to my employment? How about the benefits? Can I see the summary plan descriptions? Now, I don't think the policies and procedures or the benefits are that big of a deal. Practice revenue, it, it's a little bit more of a, a, a little bit bigger of a deal potentially. Uh, and you might not want to share that, particularly if you have a lot of competitors in your area whereby if this employee does not work out and six months later they're working for one of your competitors and you've disclosed all your revenue for the last five years. So you very well might not want to do that. <clears throat> Maybe you just give them a, something. Um, you might think through what you would be willing to share with them. But if you do, you could also have them sign a non-disclosure agreement where they're not supposed to share it and all kinds of horrible things will happen if they do. <clears throat> But that's something you may, you may get a request uh, about, so just think about that in advance. <clears throat> so uh, contractor or employee status. Now, um, in this industry, it's, it's very common to see physicians being perfectly fine being called independent contractors. They, uh, I'd say more than probably any other industry, physicians are fine, often very fine with it. They want it. Uh, they'll, they'll come out and ask for it for um, tax reasons and the flexibility, and they just like that. They're comfortable with it. And employers tend to be comfortable with it, too, because they don't have the same tax obligations, workers' compensation, benefits, all the rights and things that apply to an employment relationship aren't going to apply in the contractor setting. Um, <clears throat> however, in reality, if you are controlling the physician and telling them what to do and setting their schedule and they're working only for you and they don't hold themselves out to the public in any way and they don't, and you provide all the equipment and everything for them to do their job and the place they do their job, and then in reality they're going to be looking like an employee. They're going to be an employee. So if you're going to set them up as a contractor, you'd obviously want to change the agreement and call it an independent contractor agreement. And there's lots of provisions in there you can put in about um, the, that, you know, the physician sets their own schedule or the physician operates independently. Um, you, can, you can talk about all that kind of thing. But ultimately, if a government agency audits you or someone's looking at you, they're going to look at the agreement is only one factor. It's not controlling. So you can't pull out the agreement and say, oh, we agree to independent contractor status. They'll just look at that along with everything else. In reality, I think the risk in this industry is pretty low of anyone um, coming in and saying, I want to scrutinize your physician independent contractor agreement. But it could happen. I mean, if you got audited uh, by the IRS or your state tax agency, it could happen. So I just put it out there. You need to educate yourself. You need to be aware of it. If it's a risk you want to take, then take it as a, uh, you know, with your eyes wide open as to what the potential um, pros and cons of it are. But uh, we certainly have seen in other industries a huge focus by the federal government on um, misclassified workers. I haven't seen it really in the physician context, but yes? Um, it's not so much set hours. It's, it's more like if it's a continuing relationship where um, the person is always at your facility working, it's inconsistent with um, independent contractor status because the contractor traditionally comes in, the, the classic contractor comes in, is hired for a job, and then they go away. They don't come, they're not, now you might hire them for another job, but it's a distinct job, not an ongoing relationship. So, you know, if they're always there. Now, on the other hand, they could have, they could work for two or three different urgent cares. You could say, hey, we're fine with that. We only need you in the morning. You can go work across town in the afternoon or the evening. No problem, just don't, and we'll get to this, but don't use any of our, obviously, our confidential information or share any of that. Uh, but if you want to do it, that's fine. That I would be much more comfortable with. And you would spell that out in the agreement, and you would say the um, physician has the, op, um, the ability to work for any entity they want as long as it doesn't conflict with the schedules that we agree upon. So. You would want to think that through. There are ways to maximize the contractor status. But if you tell them, you can only work for us, and you have to adhere to this schedule, then they're, they're going to be an employee. Uh, 
Um, well, when they're traditional contractors, sometimes what we'll put in the contract, the employer will say, I'm not covering your malpractice. You have to do that yourself. And you also, contractor, have to indemnify us for any losses that occur that, that are resulting from you. So you would push the malpractice obligation onto them. That would be consistent with contractor status. You're saying, hey, we don't, we're not covering you because you're not an employee. So, but if they're an employee, obviously they're coming under your malpractice. So that would, if you in the agreement say in a paragraph, <clears throat> contractor is responsible, solely responsible for all insurance, that is a factor that definitely tilts towards legitimately contractor. On the other hand, if you put in the agreement, company pays for um, contractors med mal, then that's one more factor that makes it, uh, this is probably really a, more like an employee. So, <clears throat> so um, think through the parties. I mean, in a lot of the urgent care situations, it may be more sim it may be simpler in that it's just the center and the doctor. But think through, is there a hospital involved in your particular setup or some other third party organization? Are you in a state that has corporate practice of medicine uh, doctrine? which is a whole other seminar into itself, but that essentially prohibits a, um, a corporation from employing physicians uh, to, to provide medical care. So like New York or California, if you're in one of those states, you're going to have to, you may have to set up like a medical service organization. Again, it's a whole other topic, but you've got to think that through. Who, who are the parties? Are we in a corporate practice of medicine state? How are we setting up this agreement? It's, it may be more, much more complicated than just issuing out a, um, an agreement and having the doctor sign it. <clears throat> so compensation, you're going to obviously this is, yes? Is there a limitation on the ratio, the number of employees I can have or only contractors I can have? I mean, can I just have 10 contractors and no employees? Uh, as you could, there's no as long as they're all legitimately contractors. In fact, yeah, well, that's actually that tends to be better. Uh, if you're because your argument is because see if you have half employees and half contractors, then the argument from the government will be well that's weird because they're doing the exact same thing, and sometimes we'll see we'll see that and the contractor agreement and the employee agreement employment agreement are essentially the same. It's just one says contractor and one says employee. So consistency is good. You would want to say they're all contractors. Um, it allows them all to work at any urgent care center in the New York area or whatever. It allows them, it requires all of them to get their med mal. Uh, they can set their own schedules as long as we negotiate it in advance, things of that nature. So that's actually better as opposed to having half employee, half contractor, and then it gets confusing. If you're treating them the same, they look like, the contractors then look like employees. That would be more consistent with contractor status, yeah. That's what I more likely see in a contractor agreement. Yeah. But it depends on, you can, you can pick that up for them. It's not going to convert them into employees. That in and of itself. You say, oh, we want to pay for it. We're happy to do so. You know, you can do that, but the more factors that tilt towards um, employee status, it's just a multi-factor test. <laughs> You, there's a um, exemption under federal law for hourly pay to physicians. They have to meet a certain amount. Okay, so I could talk to you off afterwards about the, under the Fair Labor Standards Act, but typically, uh, you know, physicians are compensated on a salary basis. But you know, if you wanted to do it hour, you'd have hourly. You'd have to make sure they hit that certain.
Right. 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 I don't have an option to keep blocking. Um, and that's, that's preserved for independent contractor status. Mm. And also, all of my PAs operate part time and work other places. So that also preserves that independent contractor status. But it's really it's a very individual thing. And, and there's no one flavor fits all. I also want to point out that with independent contractor status for precision, You're right, right. 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 Exactly. Yeah. And then on the um, non competition. Do you you can you can still have those contractors sign off on um, confidentiality agreements, so that they're not sharing your information with the other places that they're working. Um, so you know I don't know you can think about that, but yep. No, I don't, I'm not aware of that hard type of test under IRS or maybe it's in a particular state. I mean, California has its own test. The IRS has a test. The California Tax Board has a test. I mean, Colorado might have its own test. You know, every, there's, they're all generally pretty similar. So maybe that applies to some particular state, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it doesn't automatically. It, you, no, no. It's like I mean, with he, what he's saying, if you put in the agreement that you have the ability to do that, and you have the, and we're not restricting you to only work here. So, no. Yeah. So, um, in terms of compensation, there's different things you can think about in advance of how you want to motivate them. Do you want to give them a percentage of productivity bonus, percentage of collections, um, uh, or do you want to give them other bonuses based on salary or things of that nature? How are you going to handle um, expenses? So think that through in advance. Uh, most physicians are going to expect, if you're going to be getting into the, um, the salary, and, or I'm sorry, the productivity and the collections bonuses, you're going to need to provide them with an accounting, at least on a reasonable basis so that they can see that they're properly being compensated. But um, percentage of productivity bonus and percentage of collections bonus are really common and it's a way to kind of motivate them to, to um, help out, perform. So also uh, you, we want to think about this in advance. Yes. Right.
Yeah. Well, the doctors are exempt. I mean, what do you, you don't, you mean pay them? Well, you put them, this is why you put them on a salary and they're exempt employees. I mean, they could work all into the night and they, you're paying them the same. And their productivity bonus is lower because they're just not, they're seeing eight patients when they could have seen 16 in the day or whatever. Right. So. But they don't work, they work two shifts one month and seven shifts the next month. Well, I mean, and that's part of putting this in the agreement. Like, you need to do a minimum of shifts or we will advise, we will tell you on a month-to-month -month basis how many shifts we expect out of you or things like that can be spelled out in advance. And then if they're not meeting it, you want to be, you can terminate. So you have the ability to do all that in advance, and that's even something in the offer letter you could put in, like minimum of however many shifts a month or whatever it might be. Um, that can all be done in advance. Yeah, there's, there's a, well, yeah, you can't fee split with corporations and corporate practice in medicine states and things like that, and with non-physicians and all of that. So, yes, that's kind of outside the scope of today. That's fee splitting and Stark laws and anti-kickback and all that, um, which I think I have touched on in one of my other slides. But, yeah, it, it, total, definitely. Can I go back to the uh, contract Yeah. No, if they're a contractor, you wouldn't cover them for work comp. I'm getting a lot of pushback uh, in my state on uh, basically saying no matter what I say, I'm still going to be fired. Yeah. Um, and that's a difference between true Well, traditionally, you know, employers are only responsible for work comp for employees. And if you're calling them, contractors and providing work comp, then the auditor from the government is just going to say, well, this is clearly in, indicative of uh, employment status. Yeah. Right. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, when, it, when, when scrutiny comes from the government, You've got to you've got to be ready for to be able to explain, and you start with the agreement, and you talk about things like they're independent; they can do what they want. They can they can work for other entities. They're we're not controlling them in any significant fashion. So, but working for other entities is an important one to put in, or <coughs> not not you know controlling how they provide the day to day care. I mean, obviously physicians have that kind of embedded in the profession, but other language about they get to determine when they work and when they don't and all that is helpful. Okay. Um, let's see. Okay, so just this comes up a lot in across all industries. You just need to think this through if you're giving them some productivity based compensation. Employers often skip this step. What happens after we terminate them and we promise them some type of commission or bonus or something, but we forgot to think about we terminated them, now do we have to pay it to them? Like, let's say it's not collected yet, or and a full accounting hasn't been done on it, or, or whatever. So you, typically, if you terminate them with cause, you want to have something in the agreement saying, if we terminate you for cause, we don't have to pay you anything. Um, if we terminate you without cause, or if you resign for good reasons, such as typically defined as um, radical change in duties, or maybe you're assigned from one clinic to an center to another or whatever, then that's usually asked for by the employee. You don't necessarily have to propose that to them, but um, that wouldn't be terribly unreasonable for an employee to say, hey, let me get my payments post-termination if you terminate me without cause. Setting it up, whatever you're paying them, pro rata, and um, you know, do they have to be employed on the date collected to earn it, things of that nature. Also, on the way out the door, do you want someone to sign a release? Um, it's nice to have a release if you have any concern that they might sue you over something. So 
you could even put in the agreement, you will be paid X on exchange, in exchange for signing a release of claims, a standard release, etc. <clears throat> okay, benefits is pretty straightforward, but obviously you want to think this through in advance. Make sure you've got this all spelled out. We have seen this blow up on employers when they don't clearly spell out uh, what is being provided. Do you want them, um, and this, this is really more in the employment setting, um, do you want them to be employed at will or good cause termination? So at will is, a lot of states there's a presumption that people are employed at will. That means you can terminate for any reason or no reason at all with or without notice. It's the presumption. That can be overcome by a variety of things such as promises, um, either express or implied that create a contractual relationship. So that's why you want to think this out in advance and say, if they are at will, you want to say, you're employed at will. We can terminate you. We don't have to provide you with any notice or whatever you want to do. Now, you can also say you're employed at will, um, but we will, you can think about whether you want to offer them some type of notice. Like we'll, we'll give you at least 60 days notice. If you have someone who's at will and you promise them 60 days notice, then you're going to be limited to, your, your damages will be limited. They'll be limited to, um, the 60 days of pay that they could have obtained. But most physicians uh, want the good cause standard and you'll very often see them asking for that. Uh, so we'll talk about that in just a minute. But you see the statistic here, there's a lot of turnover in the, in the field. Um, so good cause will help motivate them to be more committed to your organization as will um, a term of employment. So. If you're going to say, all right, we'll give you a one-year term, uh, what are you going to do with that? Does that mean it's a one-year term to then be automatically renewed? Does it mean it's a one-year term um, to be renewed only if both parties agree? Or sometimes you'll see it's a one-year term with 90 days prior to that term, the parties will negotiate as to whether to continue their relationship. There's a variety of ways you can do it, uh, but you need to think that, about that in advance if it's not going to be purely at will. I'd say the majority of agreements I see are good cause termination. It's a, it's a one-year term, um, good cause termination. Uh, perhaps you could also set it up where you say within the first um, six months, it's, no, it's at will. You know, so you have that period of time where it goes at will and then goes over to good cause. There's lots of different ways to do it, um, but you want to think that through. What is good cause? You're going to want a whole section of the agreement talking about Spelling that out, um, obviously all these kind of things. Uh, the failure to perform, I always include that in the contract, and it says something like failing to meet the employer's reasonable performance standards um, with respect to policies, procedures, um, servicing, um, or attending to patients. So you've got this kind of catch-all uh, rule of reasonableness that they have to um, comply with. So you're going to want to lay all that out if you're going to go with the good cause standard. And we don't see that negotiated too much. Um, what you will see is they'll often come back and say, can you give us a, uh, a period of time to cure? So the attorney will come back and say, my client needs a period to cure uh, poor performance with respect to um, you know, the client or servicing patients or things of that nature. Now, there's things they're not going to be able to cure, like fraud, dishonesty, et cetera. But there's a, oftentimes there's an interchange on that portion of the agreement. Spell out their duties uh, in advance. What are the kind of things you're expecting from them? Location for urgent care centers uh, could end up being a big one if you have, let's say you have 10 centers or you have even three centers, and you may want them to move around at some point. You need to spell that out in advance, that that's going to be part of their, um, their expectations. What are their hours? And we've kind of touched on this a little bit. What hours are you expecting them to work? Um, can they, can they uh, work somewhere else? Uh, what's their workload, the responsibilities, all of these other things that you're going to expect them to do? You definitely want a provision in there that, uh, that says they have to inform you if anything negative happens, uh, any negative licensure event or um, any board action of any kind. They should have, they should have to tell you immediately. Um, You've got managed care contract issues, you want to spell all that out, what they have to do, how they comply with the billing, 
that all the collections belong to you. All of those things need to be detailed out in the agreement. <clears throat> Sometimes you'll see um, as a way to entice people um, a buy-in option. Do you want to offer this? If so, you know, what's the, when would it kick in? How long do they have to be there? Obviously, they have to perform in good standing for a certain period of time. You could, you know, what's the price going to be, the number of shares, et, et cetera. The simultaneous withdrawal provision deals with um, what would you do if, let's say, you had um, five doctors that had bought in and all of a sudden they mass, there's a mass exodus you know, to a competitor or something. You don't want to be stuck having to pay out to all these people. So you want to think these things, things through in advance. Um, and you, would, you could refer to a shareholder agreement. You don't have to lump all that into your employment agreement. But you would just have a little paragraph that says, you know, or you could even say, um, physician and an employer agreed to, after a period of one year, um, reasonably negotiate uh, whether a physician can enter into a, a buy-in, things like that. So it's just another way to incentivize and, and get um, talent. Um, so liability insurance, you're going to want to think this through. Who's going to pay for it? If they're contractors, we've talked about that, um, that issue. Uh, as in, you know, you've got the claims made and occurrence-based are the two major policies. The, um, the occurrence-based, there's arg you know, arguments to be made for both of them. I think that the ones that we see more commonly are the claims made. They tend to be less expensive. Uh, I would think that, the, that physicians might, might want the occurrence-based more, but uh, it's an area of negotiation. You would want to talk to your broker in advance, um, or if you have a good handle on it, that's great. <clears throat> but you want to think about which ones would we want to, which policy would we want to offer? Um, and if so, um, if it's claims made, are you going to require, who's going to pay for the tail insurance? You could say that uh, we'll provide the insurance, but you, um, employee, are going to have to cover the tail. Things of that nature all have to be thought out in advance. And there's different options, you know, by the party who terminates the agreement, by the employer if the termination is without cause by the employer after a period of time, or maybe the parties split it. So you want to think that all through and spell that out in your agreement, how insurance is going to be handled. So arbitration agreements, this is, uh, this is something that is uh, commonly used by employers as a way to kind of reduce their major, major upside in terms of risk if they had to go to court on the damages side. So an arbitration agreement basically says, that if we're ever in a dispute, we're not going to go to civil court. We agree to hire a private arbitrator who's going to decide the case. You have a lot, of, um, a lot more control over the process. It's typically going to be confidential. And some of the benefits uh, like that can be very helpful to an employer who doesn't want to be dragged into court over a, a battle um, in, a, in a public forum. So, you know, the, and the biggest, the biggest benefit that employers often point to is we don't want to be in front of a jury that's going to issue some kind of crazy award with some crazy punitive damages amount that just is just something that we can't insure and we can't deal with and we'd have to shut down over it. There's a perception that arbitrators are not as likely as juries to do that. So employers often are um, inclined to go with arbitration. It's not perfect. I mean, there's, there's definitely downsides. Uh, it can get expensive. Arbitrators are more likely to split the baby. It's hard to appeal it, things of that nature. But on balance, I will say that most employers, certainly in California, where we have so much litigation and the court system is generally perceived as not particularly favorable to employers, we see most employers really like arbitration. And so you need to think that through. Do you want to include it? Intellectual property, you want to spell this out in the agreement and have a whole section that you're owning whatever is created. Um, sometimes phys physicians do come up with innovative things that uh, you want to be able to say, hey, that's part of our property. So definitely want to include that um, portion of it. Okay, confidentiality <laughs> agreements, we touched on this a little bit earlier. So this is a critical section of the agreement. You're going to want to have spelling out, defining what is your confidential information, your finances, your policies and procedures, your patient information, their contact information, all of that. If you have, if you're operating particularly in a market with lots of competitors, 
you have to assume that if somebody leaves, they're very likely to go to a competitor. And it's, um, it's incredible the amount of litigation that is generated over this in every industry, including um, healthcare, including um, doctors and people moving from practice to practice. So what we often see uh, is doctors who will be kind of plotting to leave while they're still working for you. So they may take the job, may not be particularly thrilled with it, and then they, but they'll continue to collect their pay for a while, a long time, basically working for you while they're lining up their next position. Meantime, they're, whatever information that you have that they think might be valuable, they're taking. So we, we've seen that, we've seen litigation over that. Um, in our own firm, we've dealt with that a few times. So. Uh, you would want to spell all that out in the agreement, and the more specific you can get on what's confidential is generally the better. <clears throat> you will want to include some provisions about patient records that uh, if the, the physician, if as necessary, can have access to those records for patient care. Obviously, that's paramount. Um, you know, continuity of care for malpractice defense, they may need it, things of that nature. But um, those would be the little carve-outs that you could spell out in the agreement. Now, if they're, um, if they're, certainly if they're an employee and even if they're a contractor, I mean, we, you kind of touched on it, but you can put, you, you, you have to think through what your state allows in terms of non-compete. Um, California, where I come from, is extremely restrictive, but most of the other states are pretty good about allowing you to have reasonableness in your non-competes, whether it's, um, it, and the two major things are the time and the geographic scope. So um, you're looking at having this in the agreement and spelling out, uh, for example, upon termination, you will not be able to um, engage in a similar services within 25 miles for a period of one year, or things of that nature. You want to think that through. What does your state allow and, enact some, and, and implement something that is reasonable? All right, so other provisions you would want to include. Um, obviously, you need an integrated agreement, legal term, meaning there's got to be a little blurb in there that says this is the entire agreement of the parties, um, that it can only be modified in writing. You do not ever want to forget those um, provisions in there. And all the other kind of legal legalese that we like to call it needs to go in there. What happens if they're temporary or permanently, temporarily or permanently disabled? Um, what about attorney's fees? That can be a very powerful thing to have in your agreement if you uh, need to go after someone and you have a provision in there that says the prevailing party is entitled to attorney's fees. Um, that's, that can really uh, be, if you're in the right, that can be very, a very strong piece of leverage. So I think we're kind of, we have a few minutes left for questions if anyone wants to. Right. Right. Yes. <clears throat> um, well, California is definitely hostile to them at this point. You basically can't have them except to the extent that you have trade secrets involved. So certainly to the extent it's limited, if you're focusing on your trade secrets, in every state, you're going to be able to do that because there's a Uniform Trade Secrets Act, and you can protect all that information. With respect to the non-competes, virtually every state allows the rule of reasonableness, and they will enforce them. Um, your greater point, though, is very legitimate, which is the paper tiger issue, and I tell clients all the time, it's great to have it in there, um, but you need to think through in advance how you're going to protect the information because once it goes out the door, do you really want to spend 50 grand to try and get it back or 100 grand or more? Um, it's really hard, even assuming you got it back. In this day and age, do you know you really got it back? I mean, do you know that the zip drive that they turned over after a year of litigation wasn't copied and you're really getting the copy? I mean, it's kind of crazy. 
So you want to think through, I, I, from a practical standpoint, it's really more of getting the, um, a nice IT security vendor that you can trust. And this starts to overlap into policies and procedures in your handbook and things. But you're, in your handbook, you're going to have all the policies about you have no expectation of privacy in the workplace. We can search anything you get on that's company related. All of your handhelds, all our computers, anything, we can look at it. Um, Bank of America, for example, some guy working there <clears throat> downloaded incredible amounts of information. And, um, and they caught him because of the IT they had. So that's, that's a good story for the employer. But think of all the small employers that don't. And we get them, they call us all the time. And they don't have insurance you know, to cover it. And they don't have any way to deal with it. So it's, we always have to, they call us. They're upset. They're frustrated. They get all angry about what happened. And then we explain to them, OK, here's the next steps. Do you want to rush into court? Well, that's going to be x amount. Do you want to litigate it? Well, that could be x amount of dollars. I mean, it starts to become very difficult. So from a practical standpoint, make sure they sign off on all kinds of policies and procedures saying you own it all. You can search anything you need to to pr protect it. And then get a good outside vendor who can detect and monitor all your systems to make sure that it's protected. And this actually starts to get into HIPAA issues and all that and how you protect um, patient information. And you should be having these people on, you should be working with these people anyway from a um, cyber liability standpoint. Because that's, again, a whole other topic. Uh, but cyber liability, you need to think that through. Um, you don't want someone hacking in for any reason. So the same person who's helping you on that side, should, you can, they can very easily say, you can say to them, OK, give me industry best practices to prevent somebody from ripping things off. I want to be able to see it, you know, just like Bank of America did. If somebody's putting it all on a zip drive, I want the system to tell me that x amount of documents or the patient contact list was just ripped off. And it should send off bells and whistles to your IT person. So it's really, I, if I had, let's say I had $20,000 to spend, it's going to cost you we're not going to need that much. Let's say you had $5,000 to spend. You know, put X amount, put 90% of it towards IT, and then just get a little, get an attorney to draft up a short little provision for your policies and procedures. You know, spend 80% of it on the IT, on the front side. So. Uh huh. Um, yeah, I, I, I mean, the agreements I see, it's like 100%. Okay. I, well, I always put them in there. And the ones I see that come to me, I always see them in there. Now, they're not always legally compliant, but almost every employer I've ever dealt with, either my clients or ones that I see through litigation or whatever, there's a non-compete in there. Um, Uh, um, you can do them for them. They can be. They might be a little bit less complicated, uh, a little bit shorter. Um, I like them if they're kind of short and direct and to the point on just on duties and things like that. But um, you know, with them, you you can get into some uh, exempt non-exempt issues with federal law versus state law. Like in California, it gets a little complicated. So. With them, you want to think about what their job duties are, too, and make sure they're, you need to look at federal and state law and make sure they're matching up. If you're calling them exempt, you want to make sure they're meeting the test, and then you would have a job description. If you didn't have a, um, an employment agreement, you could have a job description that says, here's all the things they do. But you know, some employers say, well, I do, do I need an employment agreement for everyone? You don't need an employment agreement for everyone. Like, I'll see them for you know, back of the office, the file clerk or the receptionist or whatever. You don't now, but you can have offer letters for them, obviously, and they sign off on all the policies and procedures. So. Are there other considerations we have to follow in crafting what we call a standard? Oh yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs>
Yeah. You could do a little writer to your employment agreement. Okay. The, the employment agreement should say what happens. Who, if there's a buyout, does the agreement continue? Because the buyer is usually going to want that agreement to continue. Usually. It depends. I mean, if you have a good solid agreement, then the buyer's going to want to know, oh, OK, I can inherit this contract, and then I can modify it myself. But um, if the, if the um, contract ends and the buyer comes in and they have, um, they have no ability to take that over, then they've got to start from scratch. You know? So then they've got issues of renegotiating all those contracts, and it's just not as, it's not as easy. But um, you want to think that through. Um, what happens upon? A, an M&A or a buyout or a sell, who can, who can the contract be assigned to the uh, new entity? So you would want to say something like, employer in its sole and absolute discretion has the right to assign this contract to the entity of its choosing. So then in your negotiations with the buyer, you can say, do you want these contracts? Do you not? It's all up to them. And you guys can work it out as part of your purchase, and, you know, purchase agreement. Uh, and then you would say, employee, on the other hand, does not have the right to assign without employer's consent. Obviously, you don't want them you know, assigning it to another physician. So we I never see that get negotiated. That's, that's just got to be in there. You have to have the right to decide whether it goes to the new entity or not. The new entity may say, I don't want it now. I want to start totally from scratch, terminate everyone, may rehire them, may not. That's up to them. So, Okay. All right, thank you.